It's now uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker who is going to share with us articles that change the way we are practicing in Ohio. And uh, pleased to introduce Dr. Alex Kemper. Dr. Kemper completed his pediatric residency training at Duke University, followed by a combined fellowship training in health services research and medical informatics with residency training in preventative medicine at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Kemper is a former member of the US Preventative Services Task Force, and Dr. Kemper currently serves as deputy editor for the American Academy of Pediatrics journal, Pediatrics. For, um, for this, I've been waiting for this all day. This is gonna be a fabulous um, presentation. For those of you that have gone to NCE in the past, you've seen Alex and his counterpart, Lou First, give this uh, presentation. It's gonna be very, entertaining. Um, I am going to be interested to see if Alex, since he's doing it solo, if he's going to be singing, which his partner, Dr. First, often does. But um, Alex, the floor is yours and i um, ready to learn from you. Well, so thank you very much for that kind introduction, although I'm a little worried that you might have set the bar too high. Um, everybody is going to be delighted to know that I'm not going to sing. Um, so you all can relax and, and enjoy the presentation. But, um, you know, b before I get going, I just want to thank the um, uh, meeting organizers, um, not only for inviting me, but for all the hard work that, that went to, into pulling this together. You know, meeting, you know, we'd, we'd all be a lot happier if we could meet together um, in the Hilton. Um, we get a lot uh, out of it um, in terms of recharging our batteries and reminding ourselves about why we're pediatricians to start with. Um, and I think that having this kind of virtual meeting really helps um, uh, fill the the gap, but you know, hopefully um, next year we will be together. I was also really excited to get the um, the conference in the box, and um, I've already sold my hand sanitizer on eBay to um, fund my daughter's um, uh, college tuition for next year. So, so that that was particularly welcome as well. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, um, I, I don't have anything um, uh, to disclose. Next slide, please. So. Um, what I'd like to do over the next 45 minutes is to take a look at what's new in the literature, identify those topics that are relevant for clinical practice, uh, make research findings interesting and fun, and um, uh, examine opportunities to improve child and family outcomes. Um, and so you can see the acronym time there. Next slide. But you know, the reality is who, who actually has time? I mean, most of us are lucky if we can look in both years. And then with all the things that we're having to do both within our practices and in the community related to COVID, um, time is at a huge um, uh, premium. But what I'd like to highlight um, uh, over the next few slides are things that we're doing for the journal to um, try to make all of our work more accessible and also to, um, uh, give you um, uh, more time to do other things. Um, next slide. So the, before we get going about the things that the journal is doing itself, um, uh, Lewis and I always like to talk about um, work that other people are doing to save us time. And believe it or not, there's a bunch of people who go around um, condensing literature to, to save you. So um, for, um, for this year's, I'm gonna present Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Mr. Darcy, nothing is good enough for me. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, I could never marry that proud man. They changed their minds, the end. So I probably saved you, you know, weeks worth of reading right there. Um, next slide. And with the holidays coming up, I decided that I would put up a Christmas carol. So Ebenezer Scrooge, bah humbug, he'll work 38 hours on Christmas day, keep the heat at five degrees and like it. Goes to Jacob Marley. Ebenezer Scrooge, three ghosts of um, Christmas will come and tell you you're mean. Three ghosts of Christmas, you're mean. Ebenezer Scrooge, at last, I've seen the light, let's dance in the street, have some money, the end. Think how much time that could save you with your family as well. Um, next slide. But uh, on, on a more serious note, I mean, this, this has been a challenging year for us all. Um, certainly um, COVID has upended um, uh, everything that we're doing uh, in the first place. And then the, the second thing is um, uh, the, the greater tension and better realization around things like structural racism and implicit bias and how that affects um, uh, our patients and families has really appropriately come to the fore. And so, 
these two things have, have really altered the dynamics of 2020. I mean, clearly there have been a lot of other things that have altered the dynamics of um, 2020, as um, Mark Del Monte talked about um, uh, uh, earlier, but, but, but clearly this has been a difficult year. Um, if you can hit the four button, please. So uh, um, Mark Del Monte, um, the AAP CEO, um, spent some time talking about the Blueprint for Children and I would really encourage um, those of you who have not had a chance to look at it to really read about it. it there, there are four pillars in the blueprint, um, healthy, fam healthy children, secure families, strong communities, and uh, a leading nature, nation for youth. And there, there's um, uh, all bunch of, uh, a bunch of material in there that, that I think will both um, inspire you about things that we're all doing as um, pediatricians but also pointing out to things that we could be involved with um, over the coming years to help um, uh, encourage movement along these um, pillars. It, it's really a wonderful document. And if you've not had time to look at it, I, I would really encourage you to do so. Um, next slide. So um, I, I mentioned before that there are things that we're trying to do as a journal to make our work um, more accessible. Um, uh, to you as um, pediatricians, as well as uh, uh, to the general public. And the first thing I'd like to point out is that we have these things called collections. And, and there's a link up here. And um, I believe these slides are going to be made available to everybody after the meeting, or if anybody wants a copy of the slides, they can certainly email me to, to get them. But um, a collection uh, is a compendium of all the material that the uh, AAP has published on the um, uh, particular topic. Of course, it includes the journal articles from um, pediatrics as well as our sister journal, Hospital Pediatrics, but really everything else that um, uh, the AAP has published. And as you can see, we, we put together collections on um, what we think are the really important topics facing um, pediatricians um, uh, throughout the country, ranging from autism, vaping, racism, COVID-19, ADHD, depression, ethics, child abuse, bullying, uh, and victimization, um, toxic stress, breastfeeding, obesity, immunization strategies, influenza, opioid addiction, marijuana, firearm injuries, and e-cigarettes. We're continuing to put together um, more collections um, over time. The first collection that we put out was actually the one on um, toxic stress, and that was um, in response to um, the events that were going on a couple of years ago at our southern border um, to help inform um, uh, policymakers as well as clinicians about issues related to um, uh, toxic stress. But as you can see, we've really expanded these to cover a whole host of, um, of important clinical topics. I will point out that the one on COVID-19 and the one on racism uh, is all open access as well. So um, uh, anybody, even if you're not an AAP member, can get to that important material. These collections grow over time as well as new things are published. So really, if you're busy and you want to get caught up on one of these topics, this is the, the way to go. Um, next slide, please. The other thing is that over the past year, we've really focused on how we can help um, uh, uh, get our material out using um, multimedia. And so um, we now um, uh, have video abstracts on many of the articles that we um, publish. And there's a gallery, and the, the website is listed there, of all the video abstracts. Again, we uh, have just started doing this. We have on the order of about 300 of these um, video abstracts. They're all about two or three minutes um, uh, in length and really distill the article down and talk about um, why this information is useful for um, uh, busy practitioners. I've also found that they can be really helpful for teaching. So I would encourage you um, to go and take a look at our video gallery. Um, advance to the next slide, please. And then for those of you uh, who may not know, the um, uh, AAP has a new um, podcast and um, I'd really encourage you all to, to sign up for the podcast. Um, the, the podcast has had some great heavy hitters from the world of pediatrics talking about relevant issues. And then um, uh, Lewis and I um, are going to be alternating on the podcast talking about new material that has come out. But this, this podcast is it's well designed, it's, it's light and uh, easy, access, easy, uh, you know, easy to listen to. 
and it um, really has a lot of uh, really useful information. So I'd encourage you to go to wherever you get your podcast from and, and sign up for this weekly podcast. Next slide, please. All right, so let's go in and talk about um, uh, some studies. So normally when, when Lewis and I do this, we have about two hours um, and we go through a lot of studies. I, I just didn't think, um, given that we can't have the audience interaction and that we um, have a, a short period of time, that I would just hit on some that I, that I thought were, were kind of fun and interesting um, and the, the um, information for the particular article is out there. But the first one I, I picked out was um, Apps' Learning Tools Systematic Review. And I thought this was particularly important now that so many um, children are, are learning at home. So the question that this um, systematic review looked at was, um, can, can children under six years of age learn from uh, interactive apps. Next slide, please. So uh, this systematic review looked at everything that was published uh, on the issue, um, including randomized or quasi-experimental um, studies, uh, looking again at children under six. Um, the, the app had to be interactive and outcomes had to be associated with um, academic, cognitive, or social emotional skills. Those are the outcomes that they looked for um, uh, in the studies. Next slide, please. So what did they find? Well, they, they found 35 studies, and I was actually surprised when I read this that there weren't more studies out there on um, apps for um, young children. Of these 35, 29 were um, randomized, and the others were quasi-experimental. What was interesting to me, too, is if you looked at the randomized studies, um, uh, 18 of them looked at outcomes from five days to one academic year. So that's a pretty wide range and, and generally not very far out. Um, and 11 of them had outcomes from only five to 20 minutes. So, you know, talk about some sort of short term change, you know, uh, clearly we wouldn't expect anything meaningful um, to uh, really be able to be assessed in, in five to 20 minutes. So in terms of what they found though, uh, the evidence was the, the strongest and I don't want to overplay how strong the evidence was. I mean, it's certainly not a slam dunk, but that um, touch screen interactive apps for learning math um, uh, seemed to be better. They were weakest for social communication skills. And the other thing about these apps is that when you looked at the, the trials that were done, they seemed to be most effective when combined with school-based activities. So now that so many children are, are you know, attending Zoom Academy, I'm not sure what this means for how effective these um, school-based uh, apps are. And to me, this just again speaks to the broader issue of we need to be able to uh, equip families to be able to help um, educate their children during um, uh, this challenging time. Next slide, please. So the, the other study related to this was about young children's use of um, smartphones and tablets. And the, the question the study asked is, do parents really know how much their preschool age children are using their smartphone uh, or tablet? And I have to say, I'm, I'm pretty suspicious when, when um, families um, talk about how much their, their children use um, devices. And, and of course, now during this COVID period, you know, all, all, all rules are off the table. This was clearly done um, uh, pre-COVID. But, but I do think that there's some interesting lessons from this study about parents' perceptions of their um, children's tablet use. Next slide, please. So this study um, uh, uh, looked at a convenience sample of 346 um, uh, parents who had 121, um, of, uh, I'm sorry, 346 parents of preschoolers. Of those 346 parents, 120 of the preschoolers actually had their own unshared device. So their very own iPhone or uh, Android phone or iPad or, or whatever. So um, about a, a third of the, the kids in the study had their um, uh, uh, very own device. And the parents were asked about how much they used the device for a variety of um, uh, different things. And um, uh, then they, they put some double top secret software on the device that would track how often the child was actually uh, engaging with um, uh, the device. And the parents were told, you know, just let your, your child use the devices they might want. Um, next slide, please. So um, of the um, uh, study subjects, these were mostly uh, mothers. Um, they, they were generally higher um, uh, uh, SES, um, although 29% um, were below 200% of the federal poverty level. But, but this, this population in general uh, skewed to a higher education than, than um, 
uh, the general population. Um, uh, most had full or part-time work. Um, the average age of the child in the study was four years of age. And a uh, remarkable 83% um, uh, had their own tablet. Um, next slide, please. So how much did they um, use the device? So based on the software that was put on, about 40% used the device for an hour. Uh, about 25% used it for between one and two hours about 12% used it for two to three hours, and 15%, this is, this is really remarkable, we're using it for, for more than um, uh, uh, four hours. So again, I, you, you know, you could probably double or triple all these numbers um, uh, uh, based on uh, what's going on with um, COVID. Um, uh, next slide. So um, the big winner, what, what were most people spending their time on? Uh, YouTube. And, you know, certainly I, I know I personally have gone down the, um, the YouTube rabbit hole and so you can see how that time would really go up. But, um, you know, if, if parents are telling you they have their own device, but they're spending most of their time using those educational apps like we were talking before about before, they're probably not. They're, they're probably watching, you know, uh, the latest Taylor Swift video or some Saturday Night Live thing on YouTube. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this to me was what I thought was the most interesting part about the, the whole study. So how accurate are parents? Well, about a third of the time, parents underestimated how often they were using their device. About 30%, they were generally accurate. And about a third of the time, they overestimated how much they were. But listen to this, they were 70 minutes a day um, above or below reality when they were underestimating how much they were using. So it, when you ask parents, how much time does your child spend on the iPad that they own? You know, you, you have to be a little suspicious about the whole thing. Again, not a surprise, but it's, it's nice to have this in a study. Um, next slide. So um, I, I wanted to put this up as a, um, a, a sort of a special bonus thing, which is um, a study about um, kid influencers. Um, so kid influencers are these popular kids who have their own Instagram or, uh, you know, other sort of YouTube channel on um, social media that attract a lot of um, uh, children um, uh, to their um, social media outlet. Um, and this is a study that, that, that looked at, at what was going up on these kid influencer um, uh, media uh, that they were putting up videos and that kind of thing. Um, and the, the one of the key conclusions of it is that kid influencers generate um, millions of impressions for unhealthy food and drink brands um, through product placement. Again, uh, I, I think that's something that all of us probably recognize, but it, it's nice to see that, that um, uh, it, it's really borne out nice in a sort of negative way. But, um, but, but again, uh, this is something that, that you can talk about with the families that you see. Um, so as I was putting this up, it reminded me of, um, you know, Lewis and I back uh, pre-pandemic would spend a lot of time going around the country and I just wanted to share some um, uh, signs that we've seen on the road. So if you can advance things again. So here's one from Chick-fil-A that I thought was particularly relevant for Ohio. Like the Browns, we take Sundays off. Um, next slide. And then um, here's one from Wendy's. Beat diabetes, buy five Junior Frosties for $1. So, you know, I have to say, it's kind of funny to be sitting in your office alone, just kind of talking and reading these funny signs. So hopefully somebody's enjoying it, but you know, it's painful to do this without um, uh, uh, any feedback. But that being said, I'll keep going on. Um, next slide. So I, I do think it's important to step back and think about the implications of all these um, media studies that were published in the, in the last year. So, you know, there, there's lots of media use and obviously the pandemic has changed the patterns of, of use. Um, parents are often wrong about how much um, their, their children use um, smartphones. There are a lot of educational apps out there for young children, but it doesn't seem like uh, they're, they're all that educational without the um, support. Um, and I, I do strongly believe that, that, that you all as pediatricians can play an important role in supporting families around um, uh, uh, media use. Again, I, you know, we can't really interact in the way that I would like to, but it would be interesting to, to hear your reflections about how the pandemic has changed media use and, and how you address 
this and um, the related um, uh, uh, healthy behaviors. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the next slide I want to talk about is a, um, a, a fairly serious issue. This, this was a study um, entitled Race, Postoperative Complications and Death in Apparently um, uh, Healthy Children. And it asked the question, are there differences in post-surgical complication and mortality rates between apparently healthy African-American and white children? Next slide, please. So this study um, is an analysis of the National Surgery Quality Improvement Program pediatric database, which um, from, from 2012 through 2017. So this is um, information on, on surgery and surgery outcomes from 186 medical centers, um, some academic, some non-academic from um, uh, all over the country. And what this study did that I think was particularly clever was that they restricted the analysis to children who were going into the um, surgery who are otherwise healthy. So that takes that, that just gets rid of the issue of confounding by um, uh, uh, how sick the child might be um, prior to surgery. Next slide, please. So they found uh, 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 about 170,000 apparently healthy children who were undergoing surgery in this who were reflected in this database and it had um, all the information that they um, needed. And you can see the, the, the demographics um, uh, on this slide here. And most of these children, um, as you'd expect, were undergoing elective surgery. Um, next slide. So what did they find? Well, the mortality, fortunately, is, is very low. Um, for uh, uh, white children, again, these are white children who are uh, apparently healthy and undergoing surgery. The overall mortality rate was 0.02%. Um, for um, the African American children, the mortality rate was 0.07%. Um, uh, so the adjusted odds of mortality, so if you take into account their age and why they were undergoing surgery and a bunch of other factors that you would think would be associated with um, uh, risk of death. What they found is that the um, African-American children versus the white children had about a three and a half fold increase in the odds of mortality. I mean, that, that's obviously the absolute risk of mortality is low, but look at the um, uh, dramatic um, increase in, in odds for African-American children. Next slide. So, what does this mean? What, what do we do about this? And so we ran a commentary with this. I think it was very helpful in terms of um, uh, both putting these findings into context, but also talking about the kinds of things that we all could do as um, uh, pediatricians. So the, the first thing that they recommended in this commentary was traditional quality improvement activities. So we, you know, we all certainly should continue to engage in uh, those activities that can improve the quality of care that we provide for all children. But as you do those quality improvement activities, I do think it's very helpful to look and see um, if there are disparate um, outcomes and whether or not interventions need to be better targeted to um, resolve disparities. Um, they, they call for the kind of research that's needed to better understand why these disparities occur, but also what needs to be to address them and make a call for dismantling the policies and structures that perpetuate these um, uh, inequities. Um, there's a, the, the authors discuss confronting over our own biases and then also um, uh, serving as anti-racism advocates. And, and I will say that, that um, both the Ohio chapter, the AAP, as well as the AAP overall has really um, uh, embraced um, these things. And, you know, it's another um, thing that really makes me be um, proud of, of um, uh, both groups. Um, next slide, please. All right, so let's, let's switch over and talk about vaccines um, uh, uh, for a little bit. So uh, we ran a, uh, a study uh, that asked the question, how effective was flu vaccination um, during the 2018-2019 season, during which there was a late peak of antigenically drifted influenza A H3N2. And I remember when this started, I was like having flashbacks to H1N1 and was wondering if we were going to drift in our boat right off the, uh, off the cliff. So it was nice to, to get this study in. Next slide, please. So this is a study that looked at children uh, who were six months to 17 years, and they studied um, seven pediatric hospitals, and they did a lot of work to confirm who got vaccinated uh, and who didn't get vaccinated. 
Um, next slide, please. And so um, the study overall included about uh, uh, 1,800 um, inpatients, of, of whom 13% were influenza positive, and nearly 2,000 emergency department visits, of which about 20% were uh, influenza positive. And in their uh, analysis, they were able to find that the vaccine effectiveness was about 41% against um, influenza-related hospitalizations and about 51% against influenza-related emergency visits. And so I think this is an important take-home message that, that even in an um, influenza year where the match might not have been as good as we uh, would hope it to be, um, there's still great benefit from um, uh, getting the um, vaccine. And I think that this is one of those messages that, that as we um, try to vaccinate our, our patients against uh, influenza, reminding them that, that even though flu changes each year, um, the track record for vaccine effectiveness um, really, really argues for its benefit. Next slide, please. So um, uh, again, as I was saying before, even when the match isn't perfect, um, vac influenza vaccination is one of the best things that we can do to prevent, uh, protect children. And um, I, I know like many of you, uh, I'm anxious about, you know, what people are referring to the twindemic of um, uh, COVID-19 and, uh, and influenza, especially because um, our usual approaches to vaccination um, have been so um, disrupted um, as patients aren't coming into the clinic and as health departments aren't vaccinating. Um, next slide, please. So I, I did wanna add in um, a, a, some more commentary here about this because you know, the COVID-19 vaccine is on the way. It's, it's, it's coming, thank goodness. And I think that we as pediatricians are uniquely positioned to communicate about vaccines. Um, and um, I, I was, something got dropped off there, but I think that, that we're uniquely positioned to communicate about um, uh, vaccine hesitancy. This is something that we have to do all the time. And uh, I think many of you know that there's a, a recent poll that said that um, 50% uh, of the country would refuse a um, COVID-19 um, vaccine. And I understand why there's hesitancy as the you know, vaccine development um, happened um, uh, so quickly. But, but again, I, I think that it's incumbent on us as pediatricians to read the science as it comes out. And again, all we have right now really are, are press reports. So it's hard for us to, to comment too much on um, the recent announcement from um, Pfizer. But um, uh, uh, I, I do think that this is, this is an important issue. And, and as Chris just put up there, um, this is gonna be discussed more in the, the next section um, uh, after me. Um, next slide, please. So this is work that, I, that um, Sarah Bodie here at um, NCH um, uh, just had published yesterday in um, uh, pediatrics showing um, the rate of um, MMR vaccine amongst our patients by um, 16 months of uh, age. So the um, little stipple line that if you like stand close to your monitor, you can see is the proportion of children who are coming in for um, a preventive visit between 12 and 16 months of age. And the, the dot, uh, the, the dark dot represents the proportion that received um, an MMR vaccine by 16 months of life. And the tails are the 95% confidence interval. The really important thing to notice um, is look at that drop off um, uh, from the, the start of the pandemic um, uh, uh, to uh, now. And I think, it, you know, this speaks to something that we all know in terms of needing to think about creative ways to um, get the, um, get, get vaccines going again. Um, next slide, please. So um, I want to leave the vaccine issue uh, aside for a little bit and switch to um, uh, something that, that um, uh, we all face in practice, um, regardless of whether or not you like it which is um, the uh, use of the electronic health records. So this question asks, how much time do pediatricians spend with their EHR? And I think most of you would just probably say too much. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this is a study where they looked at Cerner's light on database. So Cerner is a, um, uh, 
uh, electronic medical record that's used in, in thousands of um, settings. And this group was able to get all the information about outpatient um, uh, uh, use of the um, electronic medical record by pediatricians. So when they were doing anything with the um, electronic medical record, they could figure it out. And they looked at things like how long um, clinicians were spending on chart review documentations, ordering, messaging, et cetera. Next slide, please. So the average total time spent per outpatient encounter was um, 16 minutes, but there was um, a tremendous variation by um, uh, specialty. And so I can't see any of you, but just say out loud how long you think the general pediatricians spend per encounter. Okay, everyone, everyone commit to something. All right, next slide. 13 and a half minutes. Okay, so Tara Williams, you, uh, if we were playing Price is Right rules, you would have lost. But, um, but so 13 and a half minutes is what they, what they found, although again, it feels like years per encounter. Um, how about rheumatologists? So if you know the general pediatricians are 13 and a half minutes, how about rheumatologists? Okay, everybody say something out loud and, and commit to it. All right, next slide. 26.4 minutes. All right, now you, you probably have the, the anchors, right? General pediatricians, rheumatologists, where do surgeons fall on all this? Um, all right, everyone, uh, 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 everyone commit. All right, uncover the next slide. 6.82 minutes. So Kate uh, Browering said seven minutes and that to me is like a, a winner winner chicken dinner. So, um, and I, uh, somebody asked about whether or not, you know, how they figured out scribes. Um, and I actually don't know. That would be something that, that I could follow up and, and learn. But, but it's clear that the um, surgeons are spending a lot less time. Um, I was going to make a joke about this, but a colleague here told me I should um, cut it out. That was a surgery joke. All right, next slide, please. Um, so th this is the overall um, distribution of activities that they um, uh, found across all clinician types. So uh, spending about 30% of the time doing chart review, 30% doing documentation, and 13% um, uh, ordering. There was some variation by um, clinician type. The information in this article, I think, is just so interesting to see what people spend their time doing and how it varies by specialty type. Um, you know, we could talk another hour about this, but I would really... Um, uh, and, and encourage you all to um, take a look at this um, uh, article. And, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe you could argue for why you need to change things in your own practice to improve your um, quality of life around your own electronic medical record. Um, uh, next slide, please. Oh, and the, the after hours time. So this is, this is kind of arbitrary and I wouldn't hang my hat on this, but they looked at how much, um, uh, uh, pediatricians who were mostly outpatient were spending time between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. and they found 12%. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, it, it's, the, people have so many different jobs and they have so many reasons for um, using the electronic, electronic medical record uh, after hours. I, it's hard for me to get too focused in on this, but I, I did think it was an interesting nugget to at least uh, talk about today. Um, next slide, please. So um, if you think you're using the electronic health record a lot, you are correct. And I, I think that, you know, one of the things that, you know, all of us are working on um, is how do we leverage the best aspects of the electronic health record while we diminish those things that, that lower our quality of life. So there are a lot of things that can help with quality and safety, um, but there are also a lot of things that all of us find annoying. So uh, again, this article might um, locally help you um, argue for changes that you want to make. Next slide, please. All right, so this uh, next one that I wanted to talk about is um, uh, just a small study, but I thought it was so clever that I was, uh, thought it was worth talking about. This is a study called Mailback Envelopes for Retrieval of Opioids After Pediatric Surgery. And the question asks, is there a simple strategy for limiting the availability of prescription opioids once they're no longer needed um, for patients who've undergone surgery and have gotten opioids prescribed? Um, next slide, please. So I don't need to tell you that um, uh, uh, 
drug overdose is a, a serious problem. It's a, it's a major problem in Ohio, and it does seem that the um, pandemic is worsening um, uh, drug overdose deaths. Um, next slide, please. So um, what they did in the study was um, they, they counseled families uh, whose children had undergone surgery about um, opioid danger and um, appropriate disposal of opioids that were no longer needed. And they were given an envelope um, uh, that was approved for opioid shipment um, to, to send them back in. So just to be clear, you know, you can't, um, you know, order some like manila envelopes uh, off of Amazon and give them to families to send them back. There's like very specific rules about the kind of envelopes that can be used. And, and um, I direct you to the paper where they, they talk about this, but I don't want anyone to um, uh, get in trouble. Next slide. So um, what they found was that uh, nearly 20% um, uh, 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 um, returned opioids and the amount that was returned was around 60% of what was prescribed in the first place. So clearly not everyone's returning opioids, um, but it does seem like a easy way to get rid of a lot of opioids from uh, houses. And, and certainly there's a lot of good work that's been done that shows that having these um, sit around the, the house can um, lead to um, all sorts of problems. So this was not done as a research study. There was, this was not randomized or anything like that. It was just such a clever, practical thing to see what would happen. And, and I thought this was just, just a really useful idea. Next slide. So um, again, this is, this is an uncontrolled study, um, but it's feasible and, and, and has minimal harm. Um, it's an easy uh, uh, intervention. And this is the kind of thing that when I think about what's going on in Ohio, and I have another slide up that drills into um, county level uh, uh, risk of death related to drug overdose. This is the kind of thing that, that I would think that the um, uh, hospitals across Ohio uh, could really work together um, to do. Again, it's a low cost, seems to be a high yield thing. And if it was done, within the context of a, of a study. I think that there's uh, stuff that, that we, we could really be a model for other states. So I just wanna uh, put that out there for those of you who you know, might be so interested. Um, next slide. So uh, the, next slide I went, the next study I wanted to talk about was um, smoking intention and progression to e-cigarette uh, routes and promotion, progression from e-cigarette use to smoking um, cigarettes. And this study asked, um, if there's a difference between progression from e-cigarette use to conventional cigarette smoking based on whether or not you intend to smoke um, uh, in the future. So I, I didn't read that very well, but basically the study asked, um, uh, you know, there, there's some people who start using e-cigarettes, but if you ask them, do you ever intend to start smoking, they would say no. And there's some people who intend to start smoking and they begin using e-cigarettes. And so what's the role of the e-cigarette here? Next slide. So uh, this study used the Population Assessment to Tobacco uh, and Health Study, the PATH study, which is a study that's done in multiple waves nationally, um, looking at um, uh, teen use of um, cigarettes and uh, uh, e-cigarettes. And the, the outcome that they were looking at was whether or not um, individuals became smokers, if they were ever smokers in a subsequent wave. And what they uh, began with was by asking, do you think you'll smoke a cigarette in the next year? And then they uh, evaluated whether or not they used um, uh, e-cigarettes. Now, in the next few minutes, I don't have time to go through the analysis, but just know that they looked at every confounder you might imagine, including exposure to tobacco and anti-tobacco messages and um, all sorts of demographic characteristics. Again, I, I um, point you to the actual study if you wanna see more of that. Next slide, please. So they, they found that um, uh, uh, initial e-cigarette use was eight and a half percent. So eight and a half percent of uh, non-smokers were starting to use um, e-cigarettes. Um, and again, these were non-smokers at, the, at the end of the next wave, about 3% of them were smoking. The, the two key messages from this study are, are number one, among those teens who intended to smoke conventional cigarettes, and that was about 12% of the population, um, e-cigarette use was not associated with smoking in the next year. So if you think you're gonna smoke 
uh, conventional cigarettes, it doesn't matter whether or not you use e-cigarettes. But among those without any intention to smoke conventional e-cigarettes, so if you said, if someone said to the teen, do you plan to smoke cigarettes? And they said no. And then they started using e-cigarettes. Well, those e-cigarettes uh, had a, a much greater odds of starting to smoke. So again, let me say this another way. If you are a teen and you tend to smoke, it doesn't matter whether or not you use e-cigarettes, you're gonna, you have a, a good chance of going on ahead and using cigarettes, not a surprise. But if you think like, oh, I'm never gonna use cigarettes, and then you start using e-cigarettes, you have a much greater likelihood of um, smoking. Next slide. So I think this is an important warning for patients and their families that e-cigarette use can lead to traditional cigarette use among those who don't have any intention of doing so. Um, and I think that this is one of those messages that could be helpful in terms of motivational interviewing if you have a teen that's just started using um, uh, e-cigarettes. And I, I can't uh, underestimate the role that pediatricians have played in terms of advocacy around um, uh, cigarette use, especially as um, the um, uh, uh, e-cigarettes have really taken off. Um, next slide. So um, I'm, oh, I'm really up to my end, so I just want to leave everyone with some parting thoughts. Next slide. So uh, pediatrics is our journal. You know, uh, Lewis and I and the other members of the editorial board really try to put this in a way that's going to help you, the, the busy clinician. And we're thinking about new strategies to make our material um, uh, even more accessible. I will tell you that I, I welcome any email if anybody has an idea about how they can make the, the journal better um, uh, for them. We get great ideas that way. Next slide. That um, again, the content goes beyond the page um, in addition to our usual social media channels, please go and look at our video galleries. Please um, sign up for the podcast. Next slide. Um, we have a lot of new sections, which I haven't had time to talk about today, but we, we publish a lot of quality improvement work. We have um, state-of-the-art reviews. We have diagnostic dilemmas and clinical reasoning, which are kind of like um, stump the expert um, uh, papers. We have ethics rounds where we drill into a real-life ethical issue. Um, we have all sorts of features. We have one uh, uh, article that we set aside for trainees. We um, publish on medical education, medical history. Uh, and the newest section that we will be rolling out um, starting in January is a, a, a section dedicated to articles addressing issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So again, we're really trying to think about how we can make the journal most helpful to you. Um, next slide, please. So, um, I, I, you know, this, this may sound modeling, but I, I really hope that, that our journal can not only help improve the care that you provide, but, but address burnout and, and be something that you could really turn to to um, uh, help engage you with um, the newest research findings and also um, help remind us all why we um, chose what I think is the best job in the world, which is being a pediatrician. So, um, so with that, I'd like to um, uh, end there. I can keep talking too. <laughs> Should I go ahead and address some of these questions that have come up? Oh, yeah, there you are. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, you know, oh, I know I'm, oh, no, I'm wearing it like this. Where, I, as Dr. Baldwin commented on Twitter, I'm on my fourth cup of coffee. So um, uh, thank you too. very much. I, I think, you know, very, very interesting articles and, and really do, I think, affect the way that, that we can practice. So really appreciate you going through those. And, and I, I really will say, I've noticed over the last couple of years, you know, you commented a little bit, um, you know, although the journal pediatrics has gotten thinner that we get in the mail, I really do appreciate all of the interaction, the digital information, the interaction with the journal on social media. Um, and, and I really think, I, I love the videos. Um, and for those of you that haven't done the, the podcast, the pediat Pediatrics on Call podcast, those are, are very entertaining. Um, so again, thank you, thank you very much.